Thank you. So, hi, I'm Alessandro. I work at Geosolutions as a DevOps engineer. And uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, application deployments, specifically about GeoServer deployments. So let me give a brief introduction. Uh, GeoSolutions itself uh, works with many uh, open source products. We have offices in Italy and the US, and we offer various kind of services related to, to these products. The company has strong affiliations with uh, open source software. Uh, we actively participate in OGC working groups and uh, we support um, several standards critical to GeoInt. What is GeoServer? I hope you all know. Um, in two words, it's just it's, um, a geospatial enterprise, enterprise gateway. It's uh, meant to manage and disseminate uh, raster and vector data, and it's compliant with several different um, standards. It's a brief overview. There are many, many supported uh, input and output formats. It's uh, very flexible. So application deployments, um, that's what we're going to talk about. I'll give um, a brief historical overview how, about how the technology has changed over time, and then more in depth about GeoServer and Kubernetes. So how things have changed. Um, the way we used to deploy application a uh, long time ago, uh, though it's still used these days, is with bare metal servers, where you actually had to buy or rent the hardware from a provider. And then you moved on and deploy the entire uh, stack yourself, starting from the operating system, then deploying your applications on top, and so on and so on. So the way this works, it means the server is only going to host your application, and uh, it's yours only, uh, not multiple applications. Then things evolved over time. Um, virtualization technologies were invented, and from there you were able to run multiple virtual servers on top of a single physical server. So this way you were able to run uh, applications, your systems, along to others on the same machine. And this has some pros and cons, as we will see in a second. Uh, from the application standpoint, this looks pretty much uh, exactly the same as a dedicated machine. So it was quite easy to go from one kind of technology to the other. It didn't really require any, any work from the developers. Then in the recent years, containers were invented. Uh, with containers, the paradigm shifts a bit. So you can run typically a single application um, in a container, not a whole stack of applications, and um, along with other existing applications in the same environment. So on the same machine and on the same operating system. The key here is that your application is going to be isolated from the others, so there's no um, security concern, and there's no uh, possible issues with dependencies and so on, and we'll look at it uh, later on. So bare metal, what are the pros and cons of a bare metal deployment? It's typically very fast, so bare metal, there's no visualization layer added on top, so you get the best performance that you, get, you can get from your hardware. Um, it's a single tenant, so it's secure. Uh, no other applications are running, so they cannot sneak uh, or sniff the traffic or try to get into your own uh, applications and systems. And there's no noise enable effect, that's how we call it, um, that you can have with the visualization technology. It's uh, basically the other, other applications that are running on the same machine, they can use the resources of the server, and uh, your own application can be impacted by this. So it may slow down, for instance, or could be less stable. Um, when the server is all yours, you don't have this problem, of course. 
Uh, cons, not really that flexible and scalable, uh, depending on the actual billing, how it works, how often you renew your server. It can take time to, for instance, change uh, the kind of server that you're using or um, to scale, to buy more of the same and then reinstall everything from scratch, not that easy. Dimensioning of the server is quite hard, so you have to do this in advance. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, to choose which kind of server, how big it should be. Uh, you tend to over-provision, so to buy a more expensive machines than you actually need to, just to, be, to play on the safe side. And there's also some overhead on the operations guys, so they have to install everything from scratch on the machine every time. Virtual machines, instead, uh, you have more flexibility, so you can actually start and stop the machine easily. You can snapshot them, template them, so you don't have to reinstall everything from scratch every time. Uh, you have less fragmentation of resources because you're not buying one single instance, or one single server for each uh, system that you want to set up. You're able to reuse what you have, uh, and this also leads to reduced costs, of course. Uh, it's not all good. There's a virtualization layer overhead that you have to pay for, uh, just for this magic to happen. And then you have the noisy neighbor effect, which is what I was referring to previously. So other virtual machines can kind of take over and use uh, more resources than you should or that you plan for, like CPU typically, or uh, IOPS, so disk success. And it's also a single point of failure for many different services because you're running several systems on the same machine. If the machine breaks, all the services are going down. Um, then we, we move to containers, uh, most recent technology. So what is it all about? It's a kind of virtualization technology, but it's very different from virtual machines and what you may be used to if you don't know containers. So it happens at the operating system level and uh, the operating system is providing itself the abstractions needed um, to run these processes uh, along with each other in an isolated way. Um, in the user space of the operating system and the core containers, that's pretty much what they are, running processes. Um, multiple containers share the same kernel, uh, which is a pro, uh, in my opinion, so you don't have to kind of pay the price of running multiple operating systems to run multiple system, multiple applications. And this is kind of how it looks like. So on the left, you have a containerized system with an infrastructure layer, the host operating system, and then a daemon, a Docker daemon, which is in charge of running your containers, and that's it. On top, all the processes running. On the right, you can see uh, on top of the infrastructure level, we have our hypervisor and then all the virtual machines, uh, each one possibly for each individual project, and they all have their own guest operating system. They could be different operating systems like Windows, Linux, and so on, and you cannot pay the price of running a fully full operating system uh, for each one of them. Containers are isolated. That's true for networking and uh, file system as well. So they, they come with their own kind of file system. They cannot uh, fiddle with each other. This is a great pro. Um, this is a great, a great feature because basically your application can be developed by a developer with its own dependencies and then it can be run on a container environment without even installing any requirements or impacting uh, the libraries, for instance, that are installed on, on another container. So you can freely install whatever you want in a container without breaking the other containers that are running. As we said, they share the kernel, so the resource usage is lower, and they're easy to migrate. So the fact that they're isolated and bundled with dependencies also means you can just pick one container and stop it and spin it on another machine um, without having to do anything, basically. Uh, all the requirements are there, so you can just rerun it on another machine. And the startup time is, is very, very low. We're talking about fractions of seconds 
compare that to virtual machines, it may take minutes for, for a whole operating system to come up and then all the application. What are the cons? The steep learning curve. So um, it takes some time to get used to it. The, the, the concepts, the terminology, the peculiarities behind it. So it takes some time to learn it, but it's uh, completely worth it, in my opinion. And um, what else? The existing applications must be containerized first. So it means you need to create an image for that application, and a container image, to then be able to run it. It's kind of creating uh, an ISO or a, a virtual machine image. The concept is pretty much the same. Sharing the kernel is a pro, but can also be a con if you're particularly concerned about security. Um, this is implemented quite well at the lower level of the kernel, but you never know. There could be eventually a problem that leads to uh, leakage of information from one container to another, or maybe escalation where one container can take over uh, the other one. So you cannot be 100% sure. Then we move on. Um, from plain containers, we talk about uh, Kubernetes. So the containers themselves uh, are a, a technology, so one kind of virtualization technology. When you want to manage several different containers uh, at the same time running on a machine, you need uh, an orchestrator and some uh, infrastructure behind it to be able to handle all of these containers. Kubernetes is one of the, the orchestrators available. It's the most popular by far. Uh, it comes with a ton of features and it's becoming the, the, the industry standard run containers. It's a platform that allows you to manage these containers and running them. It was originally developed by Google and it basically takes over a set of nodes, uh, a set of machines, and then creates this uh, platform to you, for you to run the containers on top. Why is it relevant? It has, um, it's quite a, quite a change, uh, but it has several pros uh, that are very, very much worth it, in my opinion. Uh, we love it, we use it on a day-to-day -day basis. It solves us many problems. Um, so, no, um, you cannot, um, the traditional deployments, you cannot really reallocate resources after the initial setup. If you ever had this, this problem where you run out of resources and you have to migrate uh, systems from one, one server to another, you know that it's kind of very painful. Uh, this can be worked around with Kubernetes. It's easier to share the resources and to spin up containers, move them around through nodes, uh, scale the nodes, and so on. Um, with virtual machines, uh, it's true you have um, better resource utilization compared to traditional deployments, uh, and better, better isolation. Um, but as we said, each virtual machine has its own copy of the operating system, which can be a bit uh, heavy. Containers are decoupling uh, the underlying infrastructure from the application. You can develop uh, a container image once and then run it across multiple systems through different providers. That's no real issue with that. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time or um, uh, rewrite or recreate a Docker image every time you change a provider or a Linux distribution or whatever. Image creation is, um, is easy uh, to roll back. So um, when you ever have a deployment, you have a problem with the, with the deployment, it's very easy to actually uh, roll back if you need to. If you ever find a problem, it's very fast. So that's another, another great pros. And uh, it provides a separation of concerns between devs and operations. Uh, typically, developers and operations had to work a lot together to be able to deploy uh, applications in a production environment. They had to fix all the dependencies and uh, together, and then eventually get to a working deployment. That's a lengthy process. Um, with Kubernetes, they try to decouple this 
So you basically have the administrators and the developers. If you grant some privileges to developers, they can run the images directly by themselves uh, in, the, in the cluster. So that frees up some time from, from the operations that they can just uh, monitor and manage and administer the cluster, the Kubernetes cluster. Mm, Kubernetes has some nice features uh, to provide no downtime, basically. Um, so like um, health checks is able to detect problems with containers, uh, eventually killing them, respawning them on different nodes and so on. So it's quite convenient in that sense uh, to provide a um, high availability system. Provide service discovery, load balancing, all these things you have to implement yourself. Uh, they come for free. They come for free with um, Kubernetes. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So if you want to try out uh, containers and Kubernetes, you need images. They are available. Uh, they are available online. G Solutions has its own image. Uh, the sources are available online. There's a link. Oops, what happened? There's a link in the um, uh, in the slides, um, and there's also an official image that just came out. Uh, you can find the blog post in the official Juicer uh, blog. They're ready to use. They're based on Tomcat, and they're quite flexible and configurable. So you don't have to implement everything by yourself. You can just reuse what we we worked on. This is an example of a Kubernetes deployment. This is kind of how it looks like. You have um, an ingress, which is basically the entry point for the whole Kubernetes cluster, and some services which provide a load balancing. Um, in this example, we have a um, split between the G server master and the G server slave. That's not necessarily depend on the kind of clustering solution that you opt for. And then we have volumes. Volumes is an abstraction provided by Kubernetes, quite convenient, that allows you to work uh, pretty much seamlessly with several different kind of um, storage, local storage, uh, block storage, file storage, and so on. There are also Helm charts available. Uh, Helm is kind of a package manager solu uh, solution for Kubernetes where you can find recipes that you need online, and just um, deploy them in the cluster. So it's quite easy to use kind of a plug and play solution. And it also provides some templating for your, um, for your deployments. You can tune uh, the architecture and the actual values for a specific environment and your specific requirements. Uh, there is one, there's a chart available, a Helm chart available in the Geosolutions repo if you want to check it out. Uh, it's available for preview. Uh, it would be great if you could test it out and give some feedback about it. Some of the best practices concerning um, deployments. Some things that we learned over time uh, it's better to start simple, so if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, you better start with a local environment. There are some projects available out there that can spin up a local cluster in no time. It's very easy to use, so you can familiarize with the whole concept and, um, and play with it for a little while before you're ready to move to a production system. Uh, and as I said, use what, what's available. Images, charts, don't reinvent the wheel because it can be quite um, hard to actually implement it yourself, especially if you're new to this. And uh, you can also try out managed Kubernetes services from cloud providers like AWS, um, Azure, Google Cloud, and so on. So that you just get a, a running Kubernetes cluster in minutes. Mm, other good things to do design the infrastructure before you actually carry on uh, the deployment, clustering strategies, storage classes, volumes. These are all concepts uh, specific to Kubernetes. So the storage class, what kind of storage you want to use, whether it's uh, blob storage, network storage, or local storage, it's very important for each one of um, 
um, the things that you, you want to save in your container. And we'll look at that in a second. And it's very recommended, highly recommended to implement logging and monitoring solution. With containers, uh, specifically with Kubernetes, the environment is very dynamic. So containers are spawned and they can get killed at every time. They may be respawned on other nodes, so it's very hard to keep track of them um, individually and maybe spot the logs of a given container or given pod. So it's better to centralize all the logs in a central location where you're able to filter and search for you, what you need instead of uh, running around with con through the console and checking uh, every node of your, of your infrastructure. Uh, storage classes, as I said, uh, quite important to get this right. Um, each one has its pros and cons. Uh, depending on what you want to save in there, you should pick one or the other. This is kind of a typical um, setup uh, where you have shared volumes for uh, cache tiles, uh, juice of the data deer, and the raster data. So that's something that you want to save once and share between all the GSF instances in your cluster, so they can get to the configuration, they can get uh, the raster files, um, and they can get the tiles. Uh, they can share them between, uh, between all of them. Uh, logs and audit files, uh, they typically change a lot. You get a lots of writes on these files, and you don't want to put them in a, um, you don't want to put them in a, in a shared storage because the IOPS, the input-output operations, can be taxing on them and uh, may not be able to keep up. So it may actually slow you down. So that's why you, we use local storage. Um, and yes, external databases, you can use one of the provided managed services by a cloud provider or spin up your own cluster in your, uh, in your Kubernetes. There are Helm charts out there you can easily use to spin up a dedicated Postgres cluster. One good one that we use, we like to use, is the Zalando one, for instance. And you get a fully fledged uh, master slave Postgres cluster uh, spun up in uh, very easily in minutes. So as we said, local storage uh, is not, not shared between all the nodes, of course. Remember that it can fail, so you don't want to save uh, valuable data on them. The logs, they must be shipped somewhere. Um, you don't want to keep the logs on the node forever. You should ship them to a centralized location. Uh, there's a very low latency uh, with accessing the local storage. So that's why it's good for uh, temporary data and uh, logs and audit files, as we said. You could eventually use it for uh, caching as well. But that means that basically you're creating one cache for each node of the, of, the, um, of the Kubernetes cluster, and then you have to manage it some way, which comes with its own uh, um, management problems. So it can be hard to take, to take care of all of them and manage all of these uh, caches. File storage is kind of an NFS, so yeah. We're kind of running out of time, it's speed up. NFS, as you said, can be used for uh, configuration and uh, spatial data. That's kind of a good fit for it. Blob storage as well, it's cheap. Uh, it scales very well. Mm, there's a high latency, but it scales very well. So you can use it, for instance, uh, for raster data if you want, or, and or cache tiles when you have uh, lots of um, users, basically. We have some use cases. This is a portal for um, uh, meteorological and oceanographical data. Uh, we ingest uh, a ton of data into the system. It stores terabytes of raster and vector, uh, and vector data. And we, we kind of worked to implement this um, with Kubernetes using use of the containers. And the performance is, is, is very good for this kind of um, sizing of uh, this volume of data and uh, the use we get on that. This is a high level view of how it's implemented underneath, uh, similar to the architecture that we've seen before. One difference is the Postgres layer here, which is implemented, as I was saying, 
with um, an operator in Kubernetes. So it's uh, um, an on-premise cluster spun up directly into the Kubernetes with uh, a Helm chart. I encourage you to check that out. It's pretty, pretty cool. That's, us. That's more we could say about uh, monitoring and logging. Uh, it's quite important to get it right, so don't neglect it. Uh, remember to, to implement something to get visibility, uh, observability of what's going on in the cluster. Um, besides logs themselves, uh, just have a can produce um, audit files. If you're interested, you can use them to create um, dashboards, visualization of sorts. It can be quite fun. Uh, we have resources on this if you want to check them out on, on our blog, on the Geosolutions blog. You will find some articles about how to implement Kibana dashboards from these audit files. That's pretty cool. This is a detailed view of the audit files. You can check the slides later if you want. And uh, that's it. So, thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, for the great talk. Uh, we have some questions coming up on Venulus. The first one is.